All right, everybody, we are picking up after World War I, and we're going to jump right into the 1920s, also known as the me decade. And there you go again, making that sound. I got to stop that. And we're going to go through a bunch of different things that lead up to the Great Depression. All right, a couple of presidencies. We're going to set the tone. And if you cannot see um, parallels to today, you're just not paying attention. However, I am very much interested in what you think about today compared to the lecture I'm about to give. All right, so um, you guys can watch the trailer for The Great Gatsby. Obviously, you guys know this is all based on uh, the 1920s and this opulence, uh, everything It's after the First World War, economy picks back up, America comes out of the First World War kind of smelling like a rose, economically speaking, because while much of Europe is devastated physically, financially, militarily, and just loss of life, America, the fighting didn't happen on our soil. We were able to provide kind of like a bank. Uh, a lot of credit was handed out by the United States to the Allied powers. And uh, then we also produced a lot of things after the war. And of course, our customers are a lot of people in Europe because their manufacturing processes are completely uh, destroyed by the war. So a lot of rebuilding happening there, and we help facilitate a lot of that. So um, we start off with 1910. Look at this lovely lady in the white. Uh, she looks real happy, right? Um, compared to the people having a real good time in 1926, uh, this is after we've got the right to vote on the 19th Amendment that is passed in 1920. Uh, it really comes through 1918-1919 out of World War I, especially really pushes things over the edge because women really help support the war effort and a lot of American society saw the value in that, and it really made uh, Wilson, President Wilson, recognize the fact that women were in fact valuable and could, you know, earn the right to vote. Aren't we lucky? So, uh, 1920s flappers, uh, hair gets cut short. We go from like the more curvy kind of figure to like this more uh, this dress over here. This is all called a drop waist, um, more androgynous, more kind of um, women are out smoking and drinking and rolling down their stockings and being a little more scandalous and showing a lot more skin, right? Generally having a probably better time letting loose. But you know what really is going to make people feel better after uh, a world war or really towards the end of the uh, first world war? Not being able to have any kind of alcohol. That seems like it's a real good plan. So uh, prohibition is the 18th amendment. So obviously it happens before the 19th amendment. And there are a couple different things that lead into the 18th Amendment. We've got uh, a lot of people who, especially women, who are saying if that alcohol is an evil, and obviously it can be abused and can be very problematic, um, but that men abuse their wives and are, don't provide for their families. We've got people who are going to war where alcohol... Um, use becomes a big problem. And we've got this idea, especially going into World War I, about things being much more austere and sacrificing for yourself and not um, consuming the goods that where facilities can kind of go and make other things uh, in a wartime effort. Uh, modern day, prime example. So there are a lot of distilleries. The distilleries make uh, hard alcohol, uh, things like vodka, gin, that kind of stuff, compared to breweries that brew ale and beer and ciders. And a lot of the distilleries here in the United States, even locally, they have stopped producing alcohol, uh, partially because um, there are places where if you were to go and have dinner there and get a drink, they're closed right now. But they have switched over from making alcohol because those facilities actually are really set up. They can make hand sanitizer. And so there are a lot of local, uh, both in Indiana and all across the nation, where they're making hand sanitizer right now during the whole corona deal. So it's this idea of they're sacrificing for the greater good, right? And so when wartime happens, these kinds of efforts are really asked of the public quite frequently and that is also asked during of the public during World War One, 
that brings alcohol consumption down combined with this idea of especially like the women's temperance movement uh, the idea that you know men need to be responsible and be good family men that kind of stuff leads to the passage of the 18th amendment uh, we know it later gets repealed with the 21st amendment which is why there's a lot of there's, there is a chain of liquor stores called the 21st amendment and this guy over here that would be al capone who makes a crap ton of money uh you get this is where you get mobsters from guys it's also where we end up actually getting nascar from believe it or not so a lot of the the prohibition you get speakeasies you get these underground um clubs and things where they are serving alcohol and it's obviously done illegally you've got what we call rum runners or people who run alcohol this is also where the fbi gets involved and created because with a lot of this alcohol being produced and doing so illegally you've got government agencies who are literally chasing these guys who have got liquor in their cars and they're trying to stop them and arrest them and a lot of these guys would strip down their cars and make them lighter and get rid of unneeded uh, stuff like a back seat in order to have more storage for the alcohol they were transporting. We get the souped up car that goes really fast, kind of like NASCAR. And the FBI are the ones who are chasing it. So they're kind of pushing those boundaries and going faster and faster. Um, again, mobsters, they make a lot of their money, especially in large cities, off of the production and distribution of alcohol. And that's why we've got uh, the mob there. So, all right, so what happens in the 1920s? We've got the election of 1920. So the Republicans nominate the handsome guy with the eyebrows in, that's number 29, and that's Warren G. Harding. Uh, Harding talks about the idea of this return to normalcy. So after World War I, he wants to kind of get away from dealing with international affairs and wants to deal with what's going on in our own borders basically tired of dealing with what's happening it's exhausting and has cost america a great deal and we just should worry about ourselves uh, a lot of americans you know the, the idealism of this what people might say pie in the sky this what oh it's this plan that's going to go perfectly wouldn't it be great if everyone just got along People realize, especially after a world war, that that is not really what's happening, and it gets really hard to to do that. Um, they're also tired of sacrificing and these big reforms that the progressive era tried to to push on them. Um, on the flip side, we've got the Democrats who nominate James Cox. Um, both guys are from Ohio, both Harding and Cox are from Ohio, and that's a really unfortunate um, presidential campaign, Harding versus Cox. I, you just can't make this stuff up, guys. So James Cox supports the League of Nations. Uh, Harding really doesn't say anything about it, but isn't the biggest fan. Um, the Democratic nominee, the running mate, the VP, um, running mate is this dude named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Remember him, he might come back later on. So Harding obviously wins this election in 1920. Uh, this is the first time that women have had the right to vote in a national election. So we get to, you know, get out there and do stuff. Uh, as we've got 1920s going on, we have a lot of movement happening in the United States. We've got a lot of people in the South moving to Northern cities, especially with, um, African Americans moving to places like Detroit and Chicago and New York, and we get the Harlem Renaissance in New York. Lots and lots of um, really great artistry, a lot of great music, writing, all kinds of really awesome stuff happening. A lot of whites from the South also move to the North. Uh, this kind of creates a lot of culture clashes between life in the South compared to life in the North. Uh, just very different ways of life. And so when you get these intermingling of these people who are trying to fight for the same jobs and move around, um, you actually end up getting a lot of race riots that happen in um, actually 26 different cities I see race riots. Um, Chicago has a rather large one. We've got people who die. Uh, 
there's about 500 people who are wounded in Chicago and over a thousand people are left homeless in the Chicago race riot. Uh, there's other ones in Knoxville, uh, Knoxville, Omaha, Washington, all kinds of big cities. Um, so that's kind of one of the outcomes of the 1920s. Lots of good stuff, but some scary stuff too. Um, we get the American Legion, which interestingly is founded in Paris by Colonel Theodore Roosevelt Jr. So he's all about patriotism. He's all about uh, conserving things like his daddy. Um, he's all about really aggressively fighting for veterans' rights. Uh, we also have the Red Scare that comes out of the 1920 election. So again, at 1919-1920, we see this Russian revolution that's happening, and we get a lot of people who get real scared about, well, are there going to be communists in America who are going to try and take over, overthrow our government? We want to keep democracy. We don't want communism. So either are we, um, are there immigrants who are coming from Eastern Europe who are communist influencing people in this country, or are we producing people ourselves who are, you know, are reds or, or pinkos as, as they call them. So, uh, Harding has somebody, something called the Ohio gang, um, or poker cabinet. Basically it's his, a lot of his buddies, um, who run his presidential cabinet. And this is kind of, I'm sure you're probably thinking it's a throwback to the kitchen cabinet of Andrew Jackson, right? He relies on these people and Harding is considered to be one of the worst presidents in U S history. Um, a lot of the stuff comes out after he dies, uh, he's got a lot of corruption that goes on in his administration. So a couple of things that go on with that, uh, I'll, I'll get into here. But Calvin Coolidge comes next, and his tagline is, stay cool with Coolidge. I mean, not going to lie, that's pretty great. Uh, and then we've got Hoover, and Hoover is the president right when the whole Great Depression and and Black Tuesday all really happen. And there's a lot of things that he, he does that actually help things more than we probably realized at the time. But if you think of anything, people are going to say there's the Hoover vacuum company that he has nothing to do with. But the idea that vacuums suck and Hoover sucks, that's probably going to be a great, great way to remember how his presidency is, is really kind of helped. So let's go into some of this. All right. Um, so on the whole, for yet about a decade of these Republican presidents and this Republican ideology of big business. So some things that contribute to the big businesses taking over in America. You got high tariffs. Remember, tariff is just a tax on stuff coming into our country. So in order to make our companies, U.S. companies, make more money or people choose the American product, well, I'll just slap a tax on the thing coming from a different country. In general, it sounds like that's a legitimate uh, business tactic, and, and it can absolutely work. Um, but it discourages other people from around the world from selling their goods here, so we might not necessarily have as much uh, choice. It also creates problems when we lent a lot of money to countries in Europe. And if the countries in Europe are trying to make money to pay us back after World War I, and they can't sell their goods to places like the United States, well, then we're hurting their economy. And when we hurt their economy, they can't pay us back. And so it, it just creates a real uh, tension-filled situation that could go a couple of different ways. Uh, law enforcement. So we all know my man TR did a lot of... Uh, trust busting and create a lot of antitrust laws, didn't want monopolies to happen. And so there's a bunch of laws on the books already for this. However, <laughs> these existing uh, laws against monopolies, we're just going to, you know, pretend like they don't exist. So there's, there's that. Uh, and as a result, if, you know, if I speed and I don't get caught or I get caught and I let, get let go, I'm just going to keep speeding same kind of thing happens with big business. And then we've got tax cuts. So tax cuts happen uh, for a lot of wealthy and bigger businesses, those big monopolies that are being allowed to grow. And the idea is that the tax cuts from the top are going to trickle down to people um, 
who work for these companies and who buy these products, but there's no real direct tax cut for middle class and working class people. Okay. So we all know that it's a uh, laissez faire, right? A hands off business approach. Uh, let everybody kind of do their own thing and business will take care of itself. So that's kind of the general idea right now in the 1920s. Okay. So Warren G. Harding, like I said, he has a campaign slogan of return to normalcy. So he's bringing America back uh, to this time where the government that governs best governs least, as Jefferson says. And he just wants to really get out of foreign policy. George Washington, you know, said something famously about that. And he's not necessarily wrong. We kind of, you know, mind our own business type of a thing. Um, but... He's got some problems. So the teapot dome scandal. So here's like probably one of the biggest scandals that come out. What happens is this. Um, he's got his cabinet members, people who advise him. And one of his cabinet members, the secretary of interior. So dealing with all things that deal with the interior of the United States, like lands and who gets the rights to be on different things, that kind of stuff. Well, this guy, Albert Fall. He is Secretary of the Interior, and he transfers a lot of very valuable naval oil reserves. So we've got a whole bunch of um, oil reserves in this place called Teapot Dome, Wyoming. It's a real place. And he's going to sell it to them, basically. And in response, like for doing that, he's going to get about $400,000 back then, $400,000 in 1921 of bribe money from these two oil dudes who are going to sell this land. Okay. And Harding signs the order that allows this to go through. Uh, the scandal comes out in 1923 and then it doesn't actually get finally get resolved until 1929. Uh, Fall is sentenced to one year in jail and the two guys who actually bribed, um, the U.S. government and Albert Fall and Warren G. Harding, they are acquitted of the bribe, right? So America is pretty much outraged at this, and it's it really undermines the Americans' faith in the court system and public officials. Like, can we really trust our courts? Can we really trust the, like the president and the people the president chooses to run things? And there's a famous quote that comes out of this that really sums it up, and it says, "quote In America, everyone is assumed guilty until proven rich." End quote. So that that really kind of gives you an idea of what Americans think of the president and the goings on of this. Um, Harding dies. He has a stroke uh, at exactly 7.30, right? And Calvin Coolidge, cool Coolidge comes in as president. Okay. So Calvin Coolidge, 23 to 1929, he symbolizes this uh, old fashioned values of being honest and being thrifty. Um, the he's known as silent cow um basically just you know keep quiet um don't need to do a whole lot he didn't really get rock the boat he really just kind of did the status quo and kind of followed in his predecessor's footsteps right so he um, manages the budget and he really cuts spending in america a lot and okay. so all of that is kind of problematic so herbert hoover Again, you can't make these names up, this guy, Herbert Hoover. So he campaigns on this idea of something called rugged individualism, right? Don't you wish your boyfriend had rugged individualism? Well, basically, it's the idea that Americans and people are going to do best when we basically are given an education. So I'm all about that. And we give them the opportunity to do stuff, and you're going to make your own way, right? Americans are very much like cut my own path, make my own way, sometimes quite literally, if we look at Lewis and Clark and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, he's a self-made millionaire himself, and he was a secretary of, Com secretary of Commerce or Business under Calvin Coolidge. So he's been in the government for a while. Okay, so um, what ends up happening is we've got this me era, this me decade, where money is being spent quite a lot. So it's consumerism. You you are what you own or you are what you buy. So workers are making more money 
and we had more leisure time because we've got the invention of a lot of time cutting devices, things like the electric uh, dishwasher and washing machine and vacuum cleaner. Uh, we've got this idea of buying on credit. We still have this today where if I don't have the cash to buy the thing I need, well, I can, um, you know, five easy payments of $29.99, right? So, but wait, there's more. So Americans are buying things, but they're not necessarily buying things with the money they really have. They're buying stuff based off of if I let you make payments. So like a credit card, it gets you in trouble sometimes because I can have a credit limit of $10,000. I don't have $10,000 sitting in a bank. I can spend 500 bucks a month and I, I could pay that off every month. Great, wonderful. Then I'm, I'm level, I'm solid, no problem. But if I spend $10,000 in a month, I don't really have that money. Some credit card company is lending me that money and I'm going to pay them back. So it's not my real purchasing power. It's what the perceived purchasing power. So it inflates the U.S. economy a whole lot because everyone starts to buy on credit. Um, so what ends up happening during this time period is you've got a lot of people going to uh, cities. A city's becoming larger. The Great Migration happens. But along with it, we've got some discrimination, both from people being racist and both from pe people culturally not understanding each other. Um, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans are immigrating. Uh, with large cities expanding, you've got sur uh, suburbia extending out, right? So the suburban area, these neighborhoods, um, you start to have cars and things that allow people to live in Indianapolis and drive to Hope, like me. Uh, if, there, if I didn't have a car, I couldn't do that. I'd have to live where I work. So these inventions of public transit and individual um, transportation allow people to kind of move further out from the cities. People are living longer and their our medications are coming along. We've got pensions with labor unions and people can retire and live off of things. New appliances are cutting the time that we spend in our homes doing things so we can have more leisure time and more time to buy things and spend on stuff. Women obviously can be employed more. We're one house with that. And we've got this new set of values. Okay. So uh, watch this video. Um, it's all about great migration. It's really good. Okay. Uh, what's going on in the world? What everyone wants to do? Well, movies. So obviously we talked a little bit about Birth of a Nation, but Chaplin, the Char Charlie Chaplin movies, huge, 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 right? Slapstick comedy, very physical comedy. He's like one of the best. Sports, Babe Ruth, baseball, America's pastime. Everyone's all about going and seeing baseball, okay? Prohibition, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we have speakeasies. So this gives the rise of Al Capone a lot of mobsters. The Lost Generation, you guys should know about this. Uh, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, they're talking about um, this kind of adrift and looking for adventure type deal. I already mentioned Harlem Renaissance. Out of that comes a lot of jazz. Uh, we've got with jazz and people messing around with different things and different musicality. We've got lots of different art and music that's happening. Flappers, same thing with fashion and dancing and expressing yourself. So I like my meme over here. It really is very true. Right. All right. On the flip side, we've got conservative reactions. So these people who kind of want to go back to the way things used to be, we've got the KKK, the rise of the KKK that happens. We've got a lot of intolerance and racism. So for all those great things that happened in the Harlem Renaissance, you've got some, some blowback, right? Some lynchings, terrible things happening. Uh, immigration quotas. We don't want too many communists coming into this country. So we're going to put limits on who can come from where. Uh, a lot of the fear of those immigrants and those people changing Americans' minds from democratic ideals into communism and socialism. This is represented in a famous trial called the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. These are two guys who are Italians who basically clearly did not commit a crime and they're put to death. Um, it gets people very riled up. Um, it's very clear that it is um, this fear of immigrants uh, and really pushing that. Fundamentalism. This idea of going back to like the fundamentals. We have the Scopes Monkey Trial where we talk about creationism versus evolution. And then revivalism when our religion, all that stuff comes back, right? So again, 
you guys, some of this stuff should probably sound familiar. We start to see some of these trends happen over and over and over again. All right. And I'm going to stop it. Let's see. Yep. I'm going to stop it right here. So this is end of the first part of Great Depression Lecture. And away we go.